I am thankful to the Theosophical Society of America for giving me this opportunity to express some of my views at this forum. I'm going to speak on the art of living. In school and college, we are taught about the separate arts of painting, sculpture, architecture, design, and so on. All those are included in the art of living, which is a much larger because it covers all relationships. Life is relationship, not only to people, but also to things, to money, to ideas, to beliefs, and so on. From the day we are born to the day we die, we are all the time in relationship with our surroundings. So I have a relationship with the sky because when I look at the sky, there is a response from my consciousness. I have a relationship with the trees and the river because there is a response from my consciousness. And of course, also to friends, to my work, to money, and so on. So it includes all relationships. And the art of living means, can there be harmony and proportion and a sense of beauty, which is the main purpose of art? The main purpose of art is to communicate the sense of beauty. When everything is in the right place and the right proportion, whether it be a sculpture or a painting or music or poetry, it produces a sense of beauty, which in turn if one is sensitive to it, creates joy in human consciousness. It is not clear why nature has endowed our consciousness with this sense of beauty, because it doesn't seem to be required for survival. But it's a great joy to have this within our consciousness. It's a somewhat mysterious thing because you can't invoke it at will. It happens to you and it produces this sense of joy when there is the right proportion. Scientists have studied this phenomenon and discovered what they call the golden ratio, or sometimes it's also called the divine ratio. Because when things have this divine ratio, our brain and our senses are so created that it is pleasant to our senses if, it, if there is this golden ratio. It may be somewhat different in music and in sculpture and so on, but in nature, it occurs very frequently, right from planetary motions in our solar system to the galaxies, to flowers and trees, 
and the human body. Everywhere there is this ratio. It's a bit of a mystery, but it evokes this sense of beauty and joy in our consciousness. It's not a thought process. It's not a sentiment. It is a sensing. And when one is sensitive to it, it arises. You can't learn it from a book or from a teacher. You have to discover that for yourself. It arises when you engage in that activity and pay attention for a long time. Then you discover the beauty in it. There is tremendous beauty in almost every aspect of our life. By beauty, I mean the innate joy which is present in engaging in that activity as distinct from pleasure or satisfaction of achievement and so on. Simply the joy of participating in that activity and paying attention. For instance, if you pay attention to classical music for a long time, your mind will develop sensitivity and you will start appreciating and seeing the beauty in that music. But initially, it may not be all that clear. So it comes up the sensitivity comes through contact, not through thinking. And therefore, it has to be self-knowledge. Something that one learns for oneself. Wherever there is a balance or a proportion, you cannot learn it from a teacher or from a book. Even bicycling cannot be learned from a book. You would have to get up on the bicycle. You can have some instructions what to do, what not to do. But you will have to get on the bicycle and fall a few times before you will acquire that balance. The same is true of swimming or driving a car and things like that. So that's why it is something that one needs to learn for oneself. And therefore it's called, it's part of self-knowledge. Also, self-knowledge is the key to wisdom. And theosophy is the wisdom religion, as mentioned by both Blavatsky and Mrs. Besant very clearly. So it is very central to theosophy, not just the ideas and the memorization of those ideas and concepts, but the actual awakening of this intelligence or this wisdom within one's consciousness, which is a form of sensitivity. If you spend a lot of time in nature, paying attention to whatever is going on in nature, you will begin to feel the sense of beauty in nature. There's great beauty in the sunset or sunrise. There's great beauty in an animal sprinting in the forest or a river or even the leaf of a tree, if you pay attention. Unfortunately, in education, we have not valued sensitivity. 
and not try to evoke it. We have valued achievement because society values achievement and measures success in terms of achievement, excellence in terms of achievement and praises you if you achieve through some technique, something better than everybody else, which is the spirit of competition. And we acquire that through our school and college training. And unfortunately, that destroys sensitivity because that creates ambition. You want success, you want achievement. And therefore, you specialize only in one narrow area. And all your thinking and your effort is directed in achievement in that area. And therefore, you don't pay attention to other aspects of life. And therefore, have sensitivity only in that professional region. In that case, it's not the art of living, because the art of living would require a sensitivity that extends right through all our relationships with nature, with art, with music. There is great beauty in every aspect, as I said. There is beauty in friendship. There is beauty in science and mathematics. When you engage in it intently, you will discover the beauty, the joy that comes out, out of that attention you pay. In games and sports, there is beauty. In gymnastics and yoga, there is beauty. And nature has endowed us with this capacity for beauty, provided we are sensitive to perceiving it. And it should be, in my opinion, the purpose of education to create this sensitivity in the student in all activities in which he is participating. Because then, whatever activity you take up in life, you experience a joy in engaging in that activity. And therefore, there is tremendous joy in life, which is the perception of beauty. And you don't need to pursue pleasure. We pursue pressure because we get bored. And in order to escape from boredom, we pursue pleasure. And that creates its own problems because then you're not satisfied with that much pleasure. You want still more pleasure. And eventually it leads to addiction. So one has to ask oneself this question. What is my right relationship with pleasure? Should I pursue pleasure? Should I eschew pleasure? Some religions have pointed out that pleasure creates desire and attachment, and therefore you should avoid pleasure or cut out pleasure. That is like cutting out life because there is so much pleasure in every activity. You eat food, it gives you pleasure. You meet a friend, it gives you pleasure. You give, go for a walk, it gives you pleasure. So what do you mean, cut out pleasure? They advocate cutting out certain pleasures, which they consider to be strong pleasures, like drinking, alcohol, or sex and things like that. But if you practice that 
to an extreme, it distorts you from within. It destroys life. Therefore, if you suppress pleasure, it goes wrong. If you pursue pleasure, also it goes wrong. And therefore, what is the right proportion? What is the right relationship with pleasure? That's part of the art of living. Similarly with desire. Desire may be a very natural thing. It energizes you to do some things. But if there is tremendous emphasis on the fulfillment of your desire, it turns into an egoistic activity, and that has its own consequences. Either your desire will be fulfilled, or it will not be fulfilled. If it is not fulfilled, it will feel, you will feel frustration, which is a form of depression or conflict within. If it is fulfilled, you experience momentarily a joy of having achieved your desire. But now that the desire is satisfied, the energy which was coming from the desire ends, and therefore you experience boredom. So one is caught in this vicious circle, because when one is bored, one is pursuing pleasure. And that becomes desire. And in the fulfillment of desire, there is the ego, which means if something obstructs you, you will push it aside, and that creates violence. And because you are completely occupied with the fulfillment of your desire. You don't pay attention to other things in life. And this whole sense of utilizing time to go in some particular direction of your desire becomes a part of your life. So one talks about don't waste your time that means you're trying to go somewhere. And that destroys sensitivity because then you don't pay attention to the river, to the flower, to the garden, to the tree, to your children. And that means in that relationship, you lose sensitivity. You lose that sense of beauty. William Blake put it very beautifully in a verse. He said, One who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. But one who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. That means if you could hold every desire like a wish, Wishes don't create any problem. I wish to eat food, or I wish to meet a friend, or I wish to go for a walk. If I can't do that, it doesn't produce any frustration. Because there is no addiction to the fulfillment of that. So can one hold all desires like wishes? If it can be fulfilled without any violence, without any destruction, you have no objection to fulfilling it. If it cannot be fulfilled, you have no objection to let it go. Then you are free. And that freedom is the art of living. That's freedom from desire. Not freedom from desire is not absence of desire. It is absence of addiction to the fulfillment of desire. So it needs a lot of clarity, a lot of wisdom. And you have to come upon that wisdom through your own perceptions in life, 
through your own experimentation in daily life. It's connected with daily life. You can't get wisdom through reading wise people writings, which doesn't mean you should not read wise people's writings. But I believe there was a philosopher in Japan called Basho who said, don't try to follow the wise. Pursue what they pursued. How they came upon wisdom, you pursue that wisdom. Don't pursue the man. Don't imitate him. Because it is something that has to be evoked in your consciousness. It's not like some activity you decide upon and do. So one has to engage with these questions and learn the art of living. Now in every activity, there is a technique and there is a certain spirit in which that activity you have to engage in. The technique can be learned from a book or from a teacher and you can practice it and improve the technique. But the spirit is far more important than the technique. The technique doesn't create the spirit. The spirit is the state of mind in which you approach that activity. Let me take a few examples to illustrate this point. In art, we have already said, the spirit of art is this sense of beauty. If you don't have this sense of beauty, what is it that you are trying to express through the art? So then it becomes mechanical. You can learn the technique. You can write a poem by knowing what stanzas and the grammar and so on. But unless there is that feeling of beauty within you, your poem will not com communicate that beauty. So there is a difference between the technician and the artist. And that's very clear in, let's say, gymnastics and so on, or in dance, where if it's a mechanical performance, it doesn't create a sense of beauty. But when it is, that sense of beauty is there in the performer, it communicates. And if you have the sensitivity, then it communicates the beauty, which, which is joy in your consciousness. So, in religion, there is the belief the ritual, the methods of worship, and so on. Those are all the techniques of religion. But the spirit of religion is love, compassion, nonviolence. If the spirit is missing, the performance of those rituals is hollow. It has significance only when the spirit is there, behind it. So that's what I mean, that coming upon the spirit is more important than learning a technique. Once you have the spirit, the technique will help you to manifest it and to communicate it. But it is first important to come upon the right spirit. In games and sports, there is the sportsman spirit, which means you engage in that game for the joy of it. Because in playing tennis or in playing cricket or whatever game you are engaging in, if you pay attention and you want to excel in your play, 
it will give you a certain joy of playing that engaging in that game but if you give too much emphasis on winning the game unfortunately that is what the society expects and they promote competition then the game becomes like a rivalry then you are not sharing that joy with a friend you are wanting victory and you have seen games become like wars people actually become violent fight with each other play foul if your opponent falls sick you feel happy that now you will win so all these negative emotions arise when you approach it egoistically with the idea of achieving but if you play it for the love of it which means to see the joy in that game then even if you are defeated in that game you admire your opponent because he played so well and you want to play more with him you want to learn from him so there is no negative emotion and you have no desire to cheat or to play foul in order to win so none of those negative emotions come into the game and irrespective of whether you win or you lose there is joy in playing the game that's the sportsman spirit but if the sportsman spirit is missing then the game becomes something morbid and you can see that it produces depression frustration violence there was this case of a man who by mistake hit the soccer ball into his own goal and they killed him for it comes from laying too much importance on the result of the game now in the gita it says in one of the verses which is famous that your concern is with the rightness of action and not the fruit of the action not the result of the action that's precisely what they are saying that your concern is with approaching this in the right spirit and engaging in for the love of it not giving importance to the result or the fruits of that action then there is sensitivity then there is joy in games and sports in government in a democracy there is the form of democracy which exists in both in the united states and in india that means there is separation of the executive from the judiciary there is freedom of the press there are elections every 4 or 5 years and you choose your representatives who go into the parliament to take decisions and make laws which all of us follow that's the structure of democracy but the spirit of democracy is one of humility we says none of us really knows what is the best way to organize society so let us sit down together listen to each other 
learn from listening, listening to each other about the issues that problems that we are facing. Then, having so educated ourselves, we shall invite proposals for what should be done. And if there is more than one proposal, we shall vote and we shall accept the view of the majority. Having done so, everybody helps in taking that decision and making it into a success. But that's not how democracies are working because the spirit of democracy is not present. They regard the opposition as enemies to be overcome. Opposition is just a friend with a difference of opinion. And in listening to his opinion and his criticism, you learn and you grow in your understanding. That's humility. But when you give, when you approach it egoistically, you don't have humility, you have arrogance, you want to win over the other. And then you cheat, you buy votes with money. So once you accept the system of democracy and then you cheat, that means you don't really believe in democracy. It's the same with marriage and family. You accept the institution of marriage, then you cheat. Because self-interest promotes this desire for greater pleasure for oneself, not caring about the whole family and responsibility. That's how the che cheating comes. So again, it is self-interest or the ego which promotes deception, cheating. The same with examinations in education. The purpose of examination is to do an evaluation. After all, you are learning something. If you are learning a language, you would want your teacher to assess of what you have learned, what you are still not learned. He needs to know that in order to know where to put the emphasis in educating you. And you don't need to know that also to know where to put in greater effort. But when you treat that as a competitive thing, to beat everybody else and come first in the group or in the class. Then getting marks in the examination becomes important and you cheat. You copy from your neighbor or take a slip of paper and so on, cheat in that examination. So this is a problem and it always comes from self-interest giving a lot of importance to one's own achievement. So democracy doesn't function well. You have seen that in the United States in recent years. And also in India, there's so much corruption, so much use of money and propaganda and lies to win elections. All that is really not democracy at all. So though we think we are a democratic country, really we are not democratic unless we have the spirit of democracy. So the spirit is far more important than the structure or the technique. Excellence at the technique does not create the spirit. But if you have the spirit, you will find a technique to express yourself. Now, what is the right spirit with which to approach life. Again, you will find 
that if you approach life with self-interest, it creates antagonism because your self-interest is contrary to somebody else's self-interest. And so there is rivalry, there is conflict. When you approach something with self-interest, you are really like a beggar asking something for yourself in that relationship. So it's not a relationship of now. Is it possible in all relationships to approach like a true friend? A true friend only wants to share life with you. He doesn't come to you in order to get something from you. There is a beautiful verse in Khalil Gibran's The Prophet on the chapter on friendship. He explains this point in a very beautiful way. He says, let there be no purpose in friendship, save the deepening of the spirit. For love that seeks aught but the disclosure of its own mystery is not love, but a net that is cast forth. And only the unprofitable is caught. The prophet, prophet is saying, you think that is profitable, but that's an illusion. It's really not profitable. Because so long as you approach life like that, always seeking something for yourself, you will never know what really love is. And without love, without wisdom, it will always go wrong, whatever you may do. We are seeing that in our society, globally. All these wars, all this animosity, both within parties in the country and also between countries, all that is basically rooted in self-interest. Not only your own self, but whatever you identify with. And so you have to learn, if, if you want the art of living, you have to learn whether it's possible not to identify with anything. Don't identify with pleasure. Don't identify with ideology. Don't identify with a religion because then you separate yourself from the other who identifies with something else. And that creates division and from division, conflict, from conflict, wars. That's what is going on. And society ultimately is what we are. If we are divided, if we are violent, if we are approaching life with self-interest, this is the kind of society we have created. And it's a direct consequence of the way we are approaching life. So it's not the art of living. The physicist Fritz of Capra was at one time very interested in what Krishnamurti was saying. He attended his lectures in Sanen, Switzerland. This must be 1970s or so. And then he went, he was so enthusiastic about what Krishnamurti was saying that he went to him and said, Sir, do I have to give up my science in order to do what you are saying? And Krishnaji said, Sir, you are a human being first, and then a scientist. So learn the art of living, then do your science. So it's not a question of whether to do science or not, but not at the expense of the art of living. 
You have not understood life. You have not understood your consciousness. You have not come upon sensitivity or joy or beauty in your own life. And you are trapped in this ambition to achieve name, fame, money, and so on, which narrows you down. You specialize more and more. You know more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing. That's, that in physics is called the Dirac Delta Function. So our education makes us into Dirac Delta Functions. <laughs> so friends, I will end it here. That there is this art of living which is the art of relationship, the art of learning. This learning is different from the learning we get in school and college. That's an accumulative learning. It's the cultivation of memory, of skills. It has its own right place. But that doesn't create, that kind of learning does not contribute to wisdom. This other learning, which we have just discussed, which is part of self-knowledge, is to come upon sensitivity, to come upon love, the ending of conflict, harmony, peace, cooperation, not competition, not success, That is the art of living. And once you have learned that for yourself, you can do what you like. You will do what you like, but you will do it because you love to do it, not as a means to an end. So to do things for the love of it and not as a means to an end, to achieve something else. That's an important value which needs to be inculcated in education right from the beginning. Unfortunately, on the contrary, we teach competition and that destroys brotherhood. Because in brotherhood, the other person is your brother. He's not your rival. Are we in a race with each other? Where are we heading to? <laughs> Ultimately, you are heading to the burning heart of the cemetery. You want to go faster? <laughs> Welcome. So, all that comes from propaganda of society. And therefore, to know what is the right relationship with ideas, not just blindly follow every idea in society, but to be able to consider, to think it over. That's the spirit of science too. That's why in the Theosophical Society we said, the quest for truth, Religion is a quest for truth, this through self-knowledge, which brings wisdom. Science is a quest for truth about how nature functions. And philosophy is also a quest for truth in the realm of ideas. So the whole thing is a quest for truth. They are not antagonistic to one another, if you understand them rightly. That learning is wisdom, and it is a byproduct of self-knowledge. 